Welcome back to the Cambridge Neuroscience Interdisciplinary Seminar Series. This series features current work from the neuroscientists across the schools and departments of our university, reflecting the pioneering work and diverse interests of our members here. Each seminar focuses on one of the new interdisciplinary themes of Cambridge Neuroscience, which we will be launching later this year. For more info on the talks covered in this seminar series and all things neuro related in Cambridge, please follow us on Twitter at CamNeuro and follow the links below. And so today we're delighted to welcome Dr. Deborah Vickers. And so Deborah is launching the series again for us this month. So we're really happy about that. Deborah is in the Department of Clinical Neurosciences, where she is a principal research associate and where she leads the Sound Lab. And the Sound Lab is the Sensory Optimization Using Neurosciences for Devices Lab. And there they look at understanding sound perception, impact of neuroplasticity on auditory discrimination, and also clinical interventions to optimize um, outcomes with hearing devices. In addition to that, she's part of an interdisciplinary group called the Cambridge Hearing Group, which is made up of about 30 researchers across Cambridge University, the uh, Anglia Ruskin University and the Cambridge University Hospitals. So with that, I'm going to pass over to Debbie and let her give you a talk. Thank you very much for the introduction. OK, so I'm going to uh, share my whole screen because I'm going to be jumping between um, my slides and YouTube. So here we go. So yes, so today I want to talk to you about um, a training program that we've been developing for children with bilateral cochlear implants using uh, virtual reality. So um, the work I'm going to talk about is part of an NIHR program grant for applied research. And so I am um, co Chief co-investigator for the grant together with Dan Jang from Guy St. Thomas's uh, Trust, who are the sponsor for the grant. These are the different institutions who are involved in the work. It's a very multidisciplinary project. Um, and we're also working with um, 12 UK cochlear implant centers as well. So I thought it'd be interesting to tell you about this work because it's based on the MRC NIHR framework on complex interventions to improve health. And it was really important that we use this when we were developing our grant application. So I thought it would be helpful to share with others um, what the work that we've done to be able to get to the stage we are now. So a complex intervention um, is comprised of a number of components it targets a range of behaviours, requires expertise and skill by those de delivering the um, intervention or receiving the intervention. There can be many potential group settings or levels within the intervention and um, flexibility. And this is particularly uh, important when you're thinking about personalised care. So in 2021, um, MRC and NIHR actually updated the framework for complex interventions. And the point was to highlight the dynamic relationship between the intervention and actually the context with, within which it's used. So this is the link. So what's interesting about the guidance is that it moves away from a standard approach of using a binary question of effectiveness, which I think many of us are very used to in clinical research. But actually, it's really important now to evaluate and explore the real world context of your intervention um, and look at the kind of complex tapestry of factors that can affect effectiveness or and use of the intervention. Within, within the framework, they require early engagement with patients, practitioners and policy makers. And this is really important for attracting funding. You need to develop an understanding of how the intervention will become acceptable to the end user, implementable within the health service, be cost effective, scalable, which means implemented, ultimately implemented within the health service and transferable across different contexts. Um, and then 
they will they, they they want a wide range of research perspectives and methods to be used when evaluating the complex intervention and as i said already they want you to answer questions beyond effectiveness so there's four main parts to this framework the intervention development assessing feasibility evaluating effectiveness and looking at the impactful implementation of the intervention I'll just show you the uh, this um, within the framework from the publication from 2021. So again, it talks about developing the intervention, but you can also identify an intervention that currently exists as well. Um, when you're assessing feasibility, you want to look at whether your intervention is practical, acceptable, or if you need to change um, aspects of the design. Evaluating the intervention is about um, developing uh, a complex evaluation that considers context. Um, and then implementation, as I've already said, is about rollout within the NHS and how, it, how you're going to, um, how the uptake of the intervention will work in the health service and how it will continue over time to be, to be used. And what's important at all stages in this process, they want the core elements of context uh, refining the programme theory, engaging stakeholders, thinking about the key uncertainties, refining the intervention and looking at economic considerations to be used in each of these four steps. So let me talk about uh, my particular example and we'll start with developing the intervention. And most of my talk is about developing the intervention because this is the phase that we're at really. So our work was informed by an NHS England uh, gap analysis. And one of the findings that they had um, showed that teenagers and older children were rarely included in research on deafness. And we thought that was really crucial because, you know, the communication and educational development of this group is critical because they're about to leave school and go into the workplace or go into higher education. And um, we should be, really making sure that their communication skills are optimized and, and help them as much as we possibly can. So this uh, was important for us. We decided to work with children with cochlear implants because um, they have, these are given to the children with severe to profound hearing loss. So they're at the greatest risk of communication challenges. And um, Cochlear implants in the UK for children, uh, bilateral cochlear implants are provided as standard of care. So there's over a million people worldwide with cochlear implants, and it's considered one of the most effective medical uh, devices uh, because of the large change in quality of life that you see. Um, now, here's where I just uh, skip out to a YouTube clip just to show you briefly what a cochlear implant is. The Synchrony Cochlear Implant System consists of the externally worn Sonnet audio processor and the internal Synchrony Cochlear Implant. The Sonnet audio processor is worn comfortably behind the ear. The Synchrony Implant is surgically placed under the skin and a flexible electrode array is inserted into the cochlea. The cochlea is the part of the inner ear that converts sound waves into nerve signals which the brain processes as hearing. The apical region of the cochlea is responsible for detecting low-pitched sounds, while the basal region is responsible for detecting high-pitched sounds. Okay, that was a, a very brief explanation of a cochlear implant. Um, and I should point out that actually that there are other companies as well as Medel, but that was available on YouTube. So that's, I selected that one. And I wanted to show you that so that you could understand um, some of the points I'm going to make later about electrode insertion for cochlear implants. Okay, so to go back to our work, um, we decided to conduct two focus groups um, with um, children who are 8 to 16 years old uh, who had bilateral cochlear implants. Um, we want to understand their hearing experiences and the problems that they face in everyday life and identified, identify any areas for research priority. They told us that um, sounds often appeared to be lopsided. 
they were struggling to use both cochlear implants together. When they were in clinic, the rehabilitation tasks that they were given, they found them uninteresting and engaging and did so they didn't actually take part in the training. But we know that training with cochlear implants is really important to be able to maximize um, outcomes. They, they requested activities that were more appropriate to their needs. They could see the value of doing training tasks, but they just didn't find, um, they just weren't interested in, in the tasks that they had been given. So they were suggesting that we should use technology to support learning. And we explored a variety of different ideas. And then ultimately came to the decision that virtual reality training would be the most engaging for the largest number of individuals. So let me just tell you something about the problem for bilateral cochlear implants so that you, you have the context. So in the UK, all children receive bilateral cochlear implants and they have done since 2009. Um, <clears throat> but even though they receive both implants uh, together, typically in the UK, other countries not necessarily the same, there's still issues and there could be problems with the mismatch between the implants in, in the two ears. For example, the electrode insertion depths may not be the same so that the, how deep the electrode goes within the cochlea can be quite different. You can have underlying problems with neural survival that can be different in the two ears. Electrode placement, and here I mean actually its position in the cochlea, so whether it sits on the outer wall or whether it sits um, on the inner wall nearer to the neurons. And clinically, there's no recognized protocols for fitting cochlear implants to maximize binaural hearing, so to overcome some of these problems. The, the main thing that clinicians will do is to check that the two implants, um, when they're switched on together, aren't too loud, so they will adjust the loudness to ensure that you can use both implants together. That isn't to say that there aren't individual approaches that different clinics use, it's just there isn't a standard protocol um, available. There's also no recognised rehabilitation protocols for um, helping patients to use the two ears together. So we decided to think about what um, what training approaches have been used with cochlear implants and what has been shown to be effective? So I, have a, I had a student, um, Hanin Reyes, who decided to do a systematic review to look at training interventions for pediatric cochlear implant users. And in her work, she wasn't looking at spatial hearing per se, but she was looking at other skills such as vocabulary skills, speech discrimination, melody discrimination and working memory. And she found nine papers that met the criteria, um, eight which were graded as having low levels of evidence and one moderate evidence. And the main causes for the scores, these low scores, were the lack of randomization, no power calculation, no blinding. Some of these aspects can be really difficult when you're trying to conduct uh, pediatric studies. So um, we decided we'd use the evidence that we had, even though. Uh, um, they were graded as, as low, the majority were graded as low. So all the studies that uh, Hanin reviewed um, demonstrated significant effects for on-task training, so seeing an improvement in the task that you're actually giving the training for. 60% of the studies demonstrated some degree of generalization to other domains, so that, um, you're trained on one task and then you're showing an improvement in another task. You might be trained on pitch perception and then showing an improvement in speech perception, for example. But the greatest effects were observed with mixed training, uh, mixed modality training, but also mixtures in the levels of training. So um, you could have analytic training, which is comparing very simple contrasts, and synthetic training, which is a much more top down training, high level skills. Um, and if you use a mixture of these, that seemed to be giving the, the the best training outcomes. Synth synthetic training alone did demonstrate some generalization to other domains, but analytic alone did not. So um, combining them did seem to be the, the best way forwards. Um, and this finding is in agreement with, with other authors as well. So very few studies re measured uh, retention effects, and this is the ability to hold on to the improvements when you stop doing the training. 
and only one study in the review actually measured compliance with training, which is quite important for understanding whether the participants have really engaged with the training that you're conducting. And quality of life was seldom measured, um, but this is actually really important for commissioners. So um, nowadays there's, there's more of a move to use quality of life outcome measures within, within trials. So that showed us that um, children with cochlear implants have uh, benefited from training interventions, but none of those uh, interventions were actually looking at localization. So we, we reviewed the field of localization training. So first, the tau demonstrated that you could improve localization abilities for adults who had unilateral deafness. So one ear was normal hearing and one ear had a hearing loss. Um, and they showed a benefit um, for training localization skills. Uh, U et al simulated unilateral cochlear implants for single-sided deafness. So single-sided deafness is when one ear has normal hearing and one in this case would have a, a simulated cochlear implant. And again, with training on localization, they demonstrated improvements. Some researchers have simulated unilateral deafness with an earplug and asked people to use the earplug for a period of time, which caused a deterioration in localization ability. But then with training, they were, at, they were able to um, overcome those difficulties and improve their sound localization with the earplug in place. And the improvements that have been observed um, are driven by uh, cue remapping, so learning to use cues in a new way, so a new localization map. The use of uh, the cues in one ear when you have one ear available, so better use of those cues, and that's a kind of cue reweighting. So you're becoming reliant upon the unaltered cues and ignoring the new cues that you have. So um, when we think about pediatric cochlear implant users, so all of that work that I've shown you on localization training was with adults. Pediatric cochlear implant users can be very different because they're born, often born deaf, and they have to, uh, you have to consider the critical periods. So the brainstem is responsible for combining the information from the two ears. And really you want to be optimizing the binaural, binaural processing whilst that whilst the brainstem is developing. But the, the results from the literature are quite complex in terms of the, the pattern that's observed, and it can be influenced by so many different factors. So um, in some cases, you can have two ears that were implanted many uh, years apart. And actually in those cases, you'll have very different pathway developments for the, for the two different ears. And that can really affect your ability to combine the information across the ears. The degree of mismatch could really affect the cue mapping, um, even if both implants are provided really early. So if you have very different insertion depths, that, that could make it difficult to combine the information across the ears. However, if there's some residual hearing existing, um, actually it might be sufficient for the brainstem development. So that individual could have um, good outcomes in terms of binaural hearing. And also we need to think about the cochlear implants themselves, the actual signal processing that's used to take um, an acoustic signal and make it into an electrical signal to stimulate the nerves has an effect of reducing some of the rapid fluctuations in sound that can be important for carrying binaural cues. And uh, Gordon et al showed that for pediatric bilateral cochlear implant users, there is some process, some processing uh, available for binaural processing, but individuals are probably making use of loudness cues rather than being able to benefit from the, the temporal fluctuations in sound. Okay, so our work, we've decided that we wanted to um, implement our training in a virtual environment, so that comes with its own problems. So to, to add to the considerations about training, we need to think about this virtual environment as well. When you implement soundscapes in virtual audio, it can really uh, disrupt the sound location cues. In normal listening environments, we use um, our, the, our head actually provides really important cues about um, the, where the sound's coming from in the environment. 
um, we, we call this kind of the head related transfer function. It has the, our heads have the effect of um, causing sounds to bounce or scatter, diffract. And so we can measure this head related transfer function for an individual and they can be very unique. And if you, you can characterize the, the, the HRTF according to the kind of frequency response, which will show how some sound regions are boosted and some regions are attenuated. And this can be used to um, understand an individual's um, HRTF. If you use the HRTF um, in, in the simulated environment, so an individual person's HRTF, it can help the soundscape uh, appear to be more natural um, and, a, and sounds become appropriately distributed in that sound space. But for cochlear implants, um, we actually have some other challenges because uh, normally you hear through your your ear canals, you know, you through your pinna, uh, sound goes in. But actually, for a cochlear implant user, the sound processor sits behind the ear, and the microphone placement is very different to a normal hearing listener. So in our work, we can measure the head size and give somebody an individualized HRTF based on that. But um, there'll have to be some kind of user to system adaptation to be able to cope with the changes in the HRTFs that we're, that we're providing. And so this is also something that we were concerned about. But I'd like to show you about some work that one of my colleagues, Lorenzo Piccinali, and his team have been doing. So um, someone in his group, uh, Stitt, at Stitt uh, in his paper in 2019, trained listeners using non-individualized HRTFs on a localization task. They had a control group that was repetitively tested without any training. They had a study group that received four weeks of training and a study group received, received 10 weeks of training. And all groups were tested at regular weekly intervals over that 10 week period. So the task um, shown here, this is Lorenzo himself. And he has a, by moving the kind of ball in his hand around, it shows where he believes sounds are coming from. So by using this task, they can understand where he, uh, his, his localization abilities. So let me show you the results of this uh, work. Along the x-axis on, on this graph is the session number. Um, and on the y-axis is the change in polar angle error. So lower is better in this situation. So a larger change means that the individual's abilities are moving uh, nearer to the accurate um, responses. And what we see is that uh, in the first few weeks of training, actually um, all groups showed to benefit, even the control group. So uh, that's kind of procedural learning in the first four to five weeks. And then after that, the group that continued with the training continued to show benefit. So they were learning to adapt to these non-idealized um, HRTFs, which is really encouraging for our work. Okay, so um, on to how we actually develop our gains. So we conduct multiple, multiple discussion groups with cochlear implant users, their families, clinicians, to really develop our strategy. The groups have helped us to design the intervention, this BEARS package, our training protocol, the assessments, our study design, our website, and our dissemination plan. So they've been involved at all levels in our program grant. And actually, without those groups, we, 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 we don't know what we've done because actually they've given us such useful feedback. And one really good example of this is the fact that we now we've had to develop an iPad version of the games because some children have balanced issues and when you gave them the head mounted display um, they couldn't see they couldn't use their eyes and uh, it was really uh, quite dangerous so we now recommend that everyone sits on a chair when they do the training and um, for some people who have known balance problems we use an iPad and also we use that for the younger participants because they found the equipment too much on, on their heads. So when we run our focus groups, we, um, we could do the focus groups and then um, we have different cycles of feedback, reflection and critical appraisal. We have a facilitator in each group 
and a note taker so that we can make sure we capture all the information. So we'll develop the materials and goals for each group. We usually do that as a group before the meeting. We prepare a package for review in the meeting. We conduct the focus group. We summarize the feedback from the group, and then we develop an action priority list. And from that, we convert it into a checklist for the research team to go through to work on before we have the next, the next meeting. And again, we keep going with this until we're happy. And we do this for so many different components of our grant. So let me just tell you about the games themselves. So we have three different games, sound source localization, speech and noise training, and spatial, spatial music training. And I'm going to escape from the um, slides again, just to show you, I've got a video clip that's probably better at explaining our games. So let me do that. Yes, here in training application suite. Uh, this is the main uh, menu. Well, here I'm using my account, Lorenz. I can actually switch user and create different accounts with different settings. And here I have uh, uh, different options. Uh, here I can select the overall volume, the playing height, the head size to, to, to uh, adapt the audio rendering and switch users. And then I can go into the play area. Now in the play area, I have my three main applications. One is related with music training, one with spatial training, which is localization, target, and one is with speech. So we can maybe have a look, uh, for example, at the speech task. Now here there are lessons. Now I've done the first lesson in order to activate the other uh, options, but the first lesson is basically a, a tutorial, a guide through to the task. Uh, we can then go into the first challenge, the first shift, and let's have a look at how this looks like. So uh, here it tells me what stars I can win depending on the on the points I make, and I can start playing. So I'm in a diner, and I have people coming around. Hi, can I order something, please? Moment. This asks for the order. I I'd press. like an apple. I select the order and then I can pick up the apple and put it down. Thank you. Great. And I get my bonus. And there's going to be someone else hopefully hey, coming up. over here. Here we go. I need to first identify who gave the order. I need to I'd like a tea, thanks. Them. Then I need to choose whatever they ask me. And then give Sorry, them. but I didn't order this. Oh, I have to select Why the coffee. Why is it taking so long? I am sorry. Amazing, thanks. There we go. And uh, who else? Excuse me. Yeah, certainly. Can I have an apple? You can. So I'm taking fruit. And then the Amazing, more thanks. I go on, the more people are going to be. Something, please. I need to identify them. I'd like any food too. There's going to be some background noise that is coming up. In the Amazing, thanks. And as you can see, it becomes more and more. Hello, may I order something? A banana, please. Now it's becoming Amazing, very rapidly thanks. more difficult. Um, Hi, can I order something, now, please? Just go back to the main menu because you got the idea then the more you go forward the more the tasks become difficult you start having uh, more complex orders uh, and you start having more background noise distractors and other things happen uh, let's have a look then uh, at the localization game maybe the spatial game here so again same the initial lesson is a simple one then we have target practice and then we have for example invisible targets so in the target practice you have both visual and auditory stimulus invisible target you have only auditory Hopefully, stimuli you've been so learning to use your here ear you have learned how to use your target. ear to in find the target the target will be and now the challenge will be indivisible can you still hit it? So here I can still see a little bit the target Great and I can job. hit it. Now, and now try again with an even harder one to spot. This is even more difficult Ooh, because yeah, it's more faint. Got it. Perfect. These and now let's try. Targets will be completely, completely invisible. invisible. Gonna be here. This is how it, it goes. And as you can see in the playing option, you also have, whoops, sorry. You also have um, uh, other options, for example, a, a game with destructors, then you have more difficult levels, or you can go back to practice target by seeing the target and or hearing it at the same time. And finally, we can have a look at the music challenge. Again, the same lessons at the beginning that let you unlock different levels. Here, for example, we can do the pitch perfect challenge. Let's have a look at this. Again, it tells me how, what do I need to do in order to gain a certain number of stars. And I can play now which song is in higher in pitch. The left one. 
So we can go back to the main menu. Okay, that gives you a flavor of the games. I'll go back to the, the slides. Okay, so those games um, that you saw there were an implementation that we've then put into a mini trial to start our feasibility work to see what the, um, the children who'd be using the games thought of them. But actually we started with older teenagers and we're starting with the older group, um, those who are 16 plus. And we've asked them to try out the, the Oculus Quest with the Bears games and instruction pack. So they've all attended Guy and St. Thomas's to receive uh, their, their equipment and to try out. So we instructed the participants to play the games for one month, at least one hour per week. And this is because we wanted to understand if the plan for the trial was going to work. And they attended um, a follow-up meeting after one month. In the actual trial, it's going to be three months, but we just want to do a one month trial here. So the feedback from the first group was that we needed further difficulty levels, um, particularly easier levels. Um, they wanted us to have different types of background noise in some of the games, and they wanted the instructions to be clearer. Based on the uh, feedback, we've actually developed another um, speech and noise setting. Another, um, um, it's going to be a pizza restaurant where people come and order different sorts of pizzas. So that will help with the younger age group. So what we're going to do is we're implementing that now. And I think that's nearly, that's nearly done. And then we're planning another phase of our mini trial. Um, and we're also going to involve some of the uh, younger age group, eight to 10 year olds, to get their feedback as well. OK, so um, in terms of setting up the evaluation, so this is now moving to the next phase, um, evaluating the use of bears. So our, we, ha we had to derive a logic model. And our logic model um, states that uh, eight to 16 year old bilateral cochlear implant users uh, who've got at least 12 months of bilateral um, experience, so they've had their implants for 12 months, would undergo the intervention. So they would um, experience training um, their spatial listening skills for at least three months, one hour per week. Um, and our change mechanism is that we're using multi-sensory integration. So it's much more engaging if you have a game where you've got visual and auditory activities and then you can interact with it. And uh, we would then expect this to generalize to non-task specific uh, skills because of the level of cognitive engagement. And the change to healthcare that we're looking at is that cochlear implant users will become better to self-administer their care, take more responsibility and take an active role in their own healthcare outcomes. And this fits with the NHS long-term plan. We'd make it available to all clinics. So this pro provides kind of equity of care across clinics. And we would expect the result of the training to be improved speech and noise perception, better localization abilities, and reduced listening effort. And then we would hope that there would be further um, health outcomes to improve vocabulary levels, improve communication, better attention, reduced anxiety, and improved quality of life. So we're looking at all of these elements within our trial that we're going to start. We also have to look at context. I mentioned this before. So we look at patient characteristics, um, different age characteristics, um, and other considerations like time between implants. And we also look at context. So the environment that they live in, the school setting that they're at, how well we, uh, the quality of the implementation of the training, the implant center, whether they use an iPad or a head mounted display. So we have many components to consider under context. And our evaluation is going to be a mixed methods evaluation. So our main trial is a mixed method, has a mixed methods design. We've got speech tests and outcome questionnaires. We've got quality of life questionnaires, health economics questionnaires, 
we also have qualitative interviews for understanding listening experiences and we have some open questions on listening experiences as well but then in parallel we've got a process evaluation which is also mixed methods now a process evaluation is conducted to understand how the interventions of a trial are achieved looking at the the reach who is using the intervention considering the fidelity and dose so that's um, if individuals actually followed what they were meant to do within the trial at the right amount of training according to what we specify um, how well the um, intervention was delivered are there enablers and barriers for delivery looking at the context and thinking about scale up which i mentioned as well under implementation but how you could actually um, scale up within the nhs so under the process evaluation we have questions about engagement we look at the context we'll get data logging from the equipment we'll conduct qualitative interviews to understand behavior changes um, and also we're going to um, part of the interviews will help us to inform our implementation strategy so there's a, a, a large mixture of outcomes we need to assess so the primary outcome is spatial speech and noise perception that's that's been the the driver for us from the outset we're using a spatial speech and noise test that i'm going to talk about again in a couple of slides we have an, we have two different measures the the spatial adaptive sentence list is actually a more conventional clinical measure and um, the spatial speech and noise is, is a newer measure we have a variety of questionnaires that are looking at quality of life again i'm going to talk a little bit more about the, the first one um, and we look at some of the aspects of the um, developmental uh, developmental aspects and also factors that could affect um, rolling out the bears as a, as a clinical measure we have some outcome measures that look at spatial uh, hearing and uh, listening effort. And again, we'll measure the health economics. Okay, so let me start just mentioning the speech and noise measures that we've got. As I've already said, we have these two measures. The spatial speech and noise test actually has a word identification component and a relative localization component. And we can, we can measure a spatial release from masking and the reaction time which is a kind of a proxy for listening effort and we can do many of these with the um, spatial adaptive sentence list we can it's a spatial rece a speech reception threshold test where you uh, adapt noise and and find the 50 percent correct point where you can identify 50 percent of the words when the speech and noise at the same location and then you spatially separate the speech and noise. We're obviously doing this virtually. Um, and then from that, you can, again, measure this spatial release from masking, which is about understanding how much speech you get when you move the noise away from the speech source. So for the spatial speech and noise test, we've implemented it in virtual acoustics. And we basically simulate a, a speaker array. In our implementation, we're actually using speakers that are 30 um, degrees separation, but you could use 15 degrees separation. Here's an example. So we have noise that comes from um, two speakers on the right. They could have come from two speakers on the left. And then the task of the individual is to hear two words, fork, followed by stalk, and indicate on the screen which they heard. But then also, the second task is to say whether they heard stalk to the left or right of the first one. So that's the relative localization task. And this is based on, we use words from the cheer auditory perception test that come in groups of four. So we can also look at error patterns as well. So that's the speech and noise task. The quality of life questionnaire that we use is being adapted from one that Quentin Summerfield developed at York University. The goal being to determine improvements in hearing with two ears compared to one ear which is quite hard to show in a quality of life questionnaire, but he managed to demonstrate this for adults. So moving from one hearing aid to two or a hearing aid and a cochlear implant, for example. And we're adapting this questionnaire to be appropriate for young people. Um, and this work's being conducted by Porrick Kitterick and his team at University of Nottingham. Just to say a little bit about the questionnaire, it basically has three domains, understanding speech when there's background noise, working out where sounds are coming from, and thinking about effort and fatigue. 
And each of these categories can be broken down into three levels of, of difficulty listening. And from that, a utility score can be obtained. OK, so that's what I want to say to you about the quality of life measure and the speech in noise measures. I'll just briefly tell you about the trial that we're going to conduct. We're going to start our trial in January. Oh, it's meant to be 2023. <laughs> Losing my years. Uh, we're going to recruit uh, 384 8 to 16 year old bilateral cochlear implant users across the 12 cochlear implant sites. There may be more centres that come on board. We're using a randomised controlled trial with half of our participants receiving bears and half receiving usual care. But we're going to tell participants in the usual care arm that they will have the opportunity to try out the bears equipment at the end. And this is the kind of patient pathway for our trial. So we'll have a baseline. Once we've consented the patients, there'll be a baseline assessment. They will be randomised into one of the two arms. They'll come back at three months for a full evaluation and then there'll be a period to assess a retention um, and they'll be tested online at six months nine months and then they'll come back to the clinic at 12 months for the final um, tests and all the way through we'll be conducting the process evaluation measures so it's a it's a pretty comprehensive trial and uh, we're currently uh, working with clinics to train them in the procedures so finally, just to mention the implementation, we're basing our implementation strategy on normalization process theory. And this is a sociological theory to help understand the dynamics of implementing, embedding, integrating your complex intervention into routine practice. So you, you conduct uh, interviews with the different stakeholders who are involved in um, the, the, the final implementation of your um, intervention. And in our case, we're going to work with study participants and ask them some of the questions that I've got here. We're going to work with commissioners. We're going to work with hospital management and we're going to work with clinicians. And again, we've got some interview questions that we've already established for these groups. We haven't um, established our questions for commissioners and hospital management yet. We're working on that phase. So some information that came from the framework, the MRC and IHR framework, suggested that decision makers will need answers from your research to look at, will this effective intervention reproduce the same effects that you found in the trial when it's implemented in the healthcare setting? Is the intervention cost, is the intervention cost effective? Compared to evidence of other interventions, is this the best option that's available now? What wider changes will occur as a result of your intervention? And how are the intervention effects mediated by different settings and contexts? And these are things that we think we've got answers for from our trial. So we're hoping that actually we'll be in a good position to be able to answer these questions. So just to summarize what I've been saying. So using the NIHR MRC framework for complex interventions, we've developed an inter uh, the BEARS intervention and the associated trial. We've used a series of cycles of feedback and implementation with our participant group. Um, and hopefully we've, in, we've created an engaging virtual reality spatial sound training package. Um, when we run our trial, we're going to run the process evaluation alongside to make sure that we understand any mechanisms for behavior change. We understand the quality of the trial implementation and also the level of participant engagement. And we're also conducting parallel work on the implementation to think about how we could roll this out in the UK National Health Service, thinking about service delivery models, maintenance, and, and how we would future-proof the game development. We're creating communities of young children, young cochlear implant users, uh, who want to share their experiences and be part of the future development, which I think is a really important uh, part of the implementation. Um, and we think that this work contributes to the development of remote care resources, which um, is really important in, in current day healthcare delivery. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and um, acknowledge my funding sources. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie, for that wonderful talk. Very inspirational to see the work that's taking place. Join us next time for a very special episode when we welcome Professor Bill Harris an emeritus professor in the Department of Physiology, Development and Neuroscience, Bill will be telling us all about his new book, Zero to Birth, 
How the Human Brain is Built, published in association with Princeton Press. For more info on the talks covered in this seminar series and all things neuro-related in Cambridge, please follow us on Twitter at CamNeuro and follow the links below. See you next time.